Today, I want to introduce a topic that I feel is a little bit underrepresented, the overlap box, sphere, and capsule physics APIs. Frequently, I get asked questions that are easily solved with this, and people just aren't aware of them. In this video, you're going to learn when you should use them, when you shouldn't use them, and a little bit of optimization trick at the end. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you. Oh, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become a reality by helping you understand fancy physics APIs. We'll start off by talking about what are these things. These are physics APIs like physics spherecast or raycast, boxcast, capsulecast, all those that we did in a video a while ago. But instead of projecting a cube or sphere or whatever forward, instead this overlaps at a particular point. So it collects any objects that are within this range that you specify with the radius or whatever based on the type that we're talking about. And it collects all objects underneath that that have a collider within the layer mask that you provided and give you all of those colliders back. These overlap functions are really helpful when you want to know what is around a specific point. For example, if you want to try to place a box on the ground because you're doing some kind of box building game, you probably don't want that box to intersect with another box. It probably has to have some kind of clearance around it. To do that, you can use physics.overlap box at the point where the player is trying to place that box. And if it hits nothing, then you know it's safe to place. This behaves similarly to something like the on trigger enter event. If we have a trigger collider and a rigid body enters, or that trigger collider has a rigid body on it and another collider enters, that will raise the on trigger enter event and you can tell that something happened. That does work well, but then you need rigid bodies in the scene. You have to add additional game objects to the scene and for the physics overlap, whatever, you don't have to have any new game objects. It's just you're calling this physics and it detects what's going on in the world at that point. So if your use case is to check if something is blocking the path to something, that's when you'd use a ray, box, sphere, capsule, whatever cast. If you want to check what's around something, you'd use these overlap APIs. If right about now you're wondering, Chris, how do you just know all this stuff? The answer is I'm not super, super smart and just know all these things. I had a really good start in college. In college, I learned a lot of really great foundational building blocks to help me be able to understand more complex things and really helped me a lot in this game dev journey that I'm on. And that's where I'd like to talk to you about today's video sponsor, Southern New Hampshire University. They offer accredited degree programs in computer science, software engineering, and even game design and game development. Now I have a software engineering degree and the degree plans of computer science and software engineering at SNHU are extremely similar to the degree plan that I took to get my own degree. And like I was saying, I feel like I got a lot of value to just understand these different algorithms, data structures, how things interact with one another in college. If you're looking to get a really strong foundation on understanding how to do game development or how to do computer science or software engineering at all, SNHU has really affordable, low cost degree programs that'll help you boost your game dev skill set. And best of all, you can take this online. So again, if you're looking to level up your game dev skill set, your programming skill set, your game design skill set, head over to snhu.edu slash Academy, fill out that contact form and let someone from SNHU reach out to you and give you more information about that degree program. Let's take a look at this demo scene and see how do they look and how can you write and use these functions. All of these cubes are just a Pro Builder cube on the default layer. I chose a Pro Builder cube just because that default Pro Builder material shows you the vertex colors. We can change the color and see it's applied. So all that our demo is gonna do here is change the vertex colors as we collide with things so we can see what's going on. We're gonna start with overlap sphere using default layer mask. So it will only collide with default. If we add the floor, we'll see that it hits the floor and that doesn't work very well for us. Let's change that back to blue. So default layer is good. As the player moves, we can immediately see this light green sphere collides with these two boxes and they turn green. So notice that it's not casting out, it's a static sphere around this particular point. Overlap sphere accepts the position, the radius, the layer mask, and whether you want it to hit trigger colliders or not. If you're familiar with ray casting and sphere casting, this should look very similar. We follow a very, very similar pattern for these. It returns an array of colliders that it made contact with. So there's not a lot of options there. It's just, hey, hit all of these things. These one, two, three, four currently hit green cubes. Every time we call overlap sphere, it's gonna give me an array with these four colliders. 
which can result in potentially a large number of objects hit. So it's important to make sure that your layer mask is only set up to collide with things that you actually want to trigger. Otherwise, you can end up having to iterate through a large number of objects. And by the way, if you're not familiar with ray casting, sphere casting, what all those are, I did a video probably about a year ago now visualizing every single physics ray cast, sphere cast, all the different potential options of casting. And we visualize all of those so you can very easily see how each of those works. I've got a link in the description to that video. Now, for an overlap box, it's a little bit different. We have the center, the half extents, which is basically like the same thing as radius. The reason we use half is you're saying how far out from the center are you going to go in any direction, X, Y, or Z. You also need to tell it what type of rotation you want to have for the box because that's important for a box, not really important for a sphere. And we have still the layer mask and the trigger interaction. And still we receive that array of colliders. So all of these are going to work more or less the same way where we define center point, then the shape of the thing, box, sphere, capsule, whatever, possibly orientation, have that layer mask and the query trigger interaction, and then we'll always get back an array of colliders. With 1.5 half extents, that means this box is total three units in any direction. As we extend that, we can see once it makes contact, boop, it changes to green. Same goes in any direction. Pretty cool. And it's rotating with the player as well, just so we can see that that rotation is important for what we collide with. There's not as many of these as casts. We only have sphere, box, and capsule. So let's take a look at capsule. This one has a little bit more information. You can set up a capsule to be on the X, Y, or Z direction, which is really important for how it collides with something. Strangely, that's not exactly how the overlap capsule works. The overlap capsule wants you to define 0 0.0, 0.1, a radius, and then the layer mask and the query trigger interaction. This is actually a little bit easier to work with than trying to figure out the radius length and orientation stuff because you're defining just the start and the end points and then based on the radius, it figures out the rest of the stuff for you. So in this case, point one is over here, point zero is over here, and then it's colliding with only this one collider. But we can change the orientation, maybe increase the radius, and we'll start hitting more things. The overlap capsule is really useful whenever you wanna see where a player can go because most of the time, the player we're using a capsule collider for and we can end up with all kinds of weird orientations if we really want to. Now the important thing about these colliders is the order that you get these back is not sorted by distance. So we have 13, 12, and 15. That may or may not be the order that they came back and are relative to the player. 13, 12, 15, let's take a look. So 12 is actually the closest to the player, but it came in second on that physics overlap. So 13, 12, 15. So these are not sorted by order. You can sort them. So if you care about which object is closest in this overlap, you need to make sure you sort them by that distance. Otherwise you may end up checking the wrong thing because if we just take, hey, the first collider should be the closest, it's gonna be this one and that might not be accurate. And I promised you an optimization part of the video as well. What we've looked at so far is only the standard overlap box, capsule, sphere, whatever. There's also ones called overlap box non-alloc, overlap capsule non-alloc, and overlap sphere non-alloc. These work the exact same way as what we just talked about, but instead of returning a new array of colliders that were hit, it returns an integer of the number of items that were hit and expects you to pass in an array that has already been allocated. So you pass in an array of colliders that it will populate based on what's going on in the world there. What this does is prevents you from having to allocate new arrays all the time, which generates garbage. And if you're not familiar with optimization, anytime that we create garbage, what happens is the C sharp garbage collector has to come by say, Oh, you made all this garbage. Let me clean it up for you. And you don't have a ton of control over when this happens. You have some. So by using the non alloc versions, we reduce the amount of garbage that our game is generating every time that we call these things, which makes our game run faster and have fewer spikes of garbage collector having to come by. It's really important that you pre-allocate an array that's large enough size to capture all the things that you want to hit. In our scene, probably a number like 10, 12-ish is probably a good number because there's not that much going on around the player. And if you've played MMOs or just RPGs in general, you've probably noticed most area of effect attacks have a limit on how many things that they can hit at once. I think this is probably related to that, as well as the obvious balancing. You don't want something that just hits a million things. It was probably imbalanced. Anyway, once you've defined how big of an array you want to have, you just pass it into that physics 
overlap non-alloc. It'll populate as many things as it hits and tell you how many were there. And that's really important because you have this array that's not getting deleted and reinstantiated all the time, it can carry over values from the last time. So if we did a physics overlap and hit 10 things, and then the next time we only hit four, it's still gonna have those six other colliders still in that array. So we wanna make sure we're only dealing with those first four that the physics overlap non alloc told us that we hit. You can of course clear the array if you don't wanna have that kind of thing. Depends on your use case if that's necessary or not. That's one of the key gotchas with these that Honestly, I have to debug all the time. Every time I use these, I end up just leaving something in there and forgetting to say, oh yeah, I have these leftover colliders and wondering why the heck is this thing all the way over there getting hit. So make sure you either clear the array or really respect what's returned by the non alloc overlap. And if you got value out of this video, make sure you've liked and subscribed. Help the channel grow, reach more people and add value to more people. If you want to support this channel, you can go to the description, click on some of those affiliate links to the Asset Store or Humble Bundle. That really helps a lot. And right now there's a really great Game Dev TV bundle going on on Humble Bundle. It's like 25 bucks to get something like 50 hours of content and some asset packs. Go ahead and check that out. See if that would be helpful to you. And if you want to support the channel directly, you can go to patreon.com slash Academy, Click join or super thanks right here on YouTube. You can get your name up here on the screen, get a shout out at the awesome tier. And all the way up at the phenomenal tier, there's Andrew Bowen. At the tremendous tier, there's Bruno Bozic. At the awesome tier, there's Autumn K, Ivan, Rulin, Ify Obelis, Solar Int, and Perry. And there's all of these great supporters as well. Thank you all for your support. I am so incredibly grateful.